Hello, I'm Jonathan Thiesing, and this is my partner Sophie Bernal. We're undergraduate students at Santa Clara University. The purpose of our project is to bring awareness and further understanding to the threat posed by CO2 emissions on coral reefs and their ecosystems. The way we are living is filling our atmosphere with CO2. Did you know that increasing amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere is warming our planet? We are increasing the probability of heat waves and floods becoming more extreme, making people's lives tougher. We need to work together to reduce carbon emissions, and some ways we can do that is by reducing how much fossil fuels we burn. Today, we will be talking about ocean acidification because global warming is its evil twin. Three billion people rely on oceans for food and livelihood, most in developing countries. The rest of us just pee in it. Not literally, but I bet you didn't think about how most of the oxygen we breathe is generated by the ocean, and the ocean absorbs much of the carbon dioxide. In a way, we are all sea creatures. Every whale, dolphin, coral reef, whatever. They obviously need the ocean. So do we. No ocean, no life. No ocean, no us. So why should we care about the ocean? The ocean absorbs about one third of the carbon dioxide that comes from our cars, planes, factories, and power plants. That alone is only 32.5 billion metric tons of CO2 every day. But what if you're not one of those three billion people? Well, do you like sea animals? Did you ever collect shells on the beach as a kid? Have you ever watched Finding Nemo, Finding Dory? Well, imagine if there are no more clownfish, no more sea stars, no more coral. But why would this happen? Why would we have less of these creatures? As the ocean warms, it takes up less and less CO2, and this, this leads to a bunch of problems. The ocean becomes more acidic, causing shells and skeletons to get weaker and even dissolve. Corals are bleaching, getting weaker, and dying out. One in four ocean species live in coral, but without coral, they won't have a home. This all happens because of a compound called bicarbonate. Now, don't get me wrong, coral reefs are really strong. They can adapt, but they need time, and they won't have enough time at the speed that we are trying to reduce CO2 emissions. Coral reefs are some of the most diverse and valuable ecosystems on Earth. They support more species per unit area than any other marine environment, including about 4,000 species of fish, 800 species of hard corals, and hundreds of other species. Scientists estimate that there may be another 1 to 8 million undiscovered species of organisms living in and around reefs. Imagine all of the new fish we can find. Having this biodiversity is considered key to finding new medicines for the 21st century. New medications are currently being developed from coral reef animals and plants as possible cures for cancer, arthritis, human bacterial infections, viruses, and other diseases. So let's backtrack for a second. What does bicarbonate have to do with anything? Well, here's a short clip to explain more. As oceans become more acidic, the number of hydrogen ions in seawater increases. Some types of coral have a hard outer skeleton made out of a compound called calcium carbonate. This compound is made of calcium ions and carbonate ions. Ocean acidification causes the amount of calcium carbonate in seawater to fall. This is because some of the carbonate ions that normally pair with calcium to form calcium carbonate instead pair with hydrogen to form bicarbonate. With less calcium carbonate around, corals find it more difficult to rebuild and grow their skeletons. This increases the chances of coral death. We are killing these corals by releasing so much CO2 into the atmosphere, creating a massive carbon sink in the ocean. Human role is so critical because we are hurting the environment and our favorite sea creatures. Of the CO2 released into the atmosphere by humans, around 30 to 40% of it dissolves into the oceans, while the rest remains in the atmosphere or it's absorbed by living things on land. 
This has caused oceans, which are alkaline, to become more acidic over time. The chemical reactions associated with ocean acidification also drive a reduction in the availability of calcium carbonate, a compound that hard corals use to build their tough outer shells. With less calcium carbonate available, hard corals find it more difficult to repair or grow their skeletons. So we did some research, and there are super small creatures called phytoplankton in coral reef systems, known as the plant drifters. They are so important to coral reefs because they are a coral's food source. Now, when corals are stressed, i.e. when they're bleaching, starting to die, etc., the phytoplankton seem to be leaving. But why? Is it because the phytoplankton are leaving the corals or because the corals are kicking them out? We asked Dr. Putnam from the University of Rhode Island. I think, I think it's a little bit more of the latter. I think that there there is some mechanism, right? When when something lives inside another cell, right? It has there's some mechanism there of crosstalk or like um, camouflage, right? That says don't detect me as something bad, right? Detect me as something good, otherwise that relationship is not going to work. Cellu like right, there won't be cellular recognition. They'll say this is a foreign object and it needs to leave, right? Uh, in sort of like cell talk, right? right? And so, so I think it's. I think it's not necessarily an active signal that the symbiont sort of quote unquote chooses in anthrop anthropomorphic terms to send to the coral. I think there's damage accruing in the symbiont, right? There's excess heat, there's excess sunlight. And then in terms of photosynthesis, that's too much for the photosynthetic system to handle. And so it starts breaking down. And because of that, then there's reactive oxygen species um, these radicals that are inside the system that can damage the symbiont cell membranes, it can damage the host cell, cell membranes, it can damage the DNA. And I think because of that, that, that symbiotic communication starts to break down. And so then they're detected as something different, right? It's detected as a foreign body and the cell, the host cell, the coral cell, um, sort of can they release it or sets in motion, um, mechanisms that would release that symbiont. It doesn't mean that symbiont necessarily is going to die. It can still be free living, but I don't think the symbiont is um, just necessarily detecting the environment itself and saying, let me out. It's it's going through its same processes and a, and a, and a signal of damage is accruing that says to the cell, start this process of releasing this, this right. foreign body. We have to remember that although many of us have not seen phytoplankton in person, that they are still important because when little things change on a big scale, big changes will follow. We think it is important that everyone cares about this problem, no matter what age, because we can all make a difference. Dr. Putnam tells us more about why everyone should care about ocean acidification. And so I think there could be a variety of reasons why, why one should care about the ocean in general and about coral reefs specifically. Um, so even if you're not directly on a coral reef, there's aspects sort of of, of nature and of biodiversity um, that are just important, right? If we think about sort of, sort of having a value, so there's value to having diversity in the world and value to having biological diversity, um, just as you think about sort of animals and plants and organisms, right? And so if you're interested in just like how the world works and, and what's living where and things like that, then then you can feel you would have a negative impact there because you would lose that biodiversity, right? But if you're not so much interested in science and, in, and diversity and things like that, I think um, economically is another really important reason, right? And, and so economically, coral reefs are valued on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars um, per year because they provide a variety of goods and services, right? They provide areas for tourism um, through diving and snorkeling and um, many people go there to look at that, look at that, um, those areas and um, they also provide um, money for, money through, excuse me, fishing and fisheries, right? So a lot of um, nursery habitat and, and, fish, and fish live on coral reefs and so money comes um, or economic effects are, are felt if we would lose our coral reefs through changes in the fish that would be available. Um, so that's directly protein for people to eat, for the people that live on the coast, um, or um, 
fish that people could eat if that, that's being imported somewhere. Um, and then if we lose that, then pe basically people are starving there and other food resources have to be split to other places, right? So it, so just like we're seeing now with all the things that are happening in the world, right, the supply chain is really important. So if you're disrupting aspects of that supply chain, people feel it even if they're not living in that particular area. Um, and then if we're thinking about things like um, you were talking about, like storm effects on coasts, um, similarly, when big hurricanes and things come through, if the coral reef is there, the big storm, the waves that are coming through and the storm that's um, coming through is, is hitting the coral reef first, right? And that's taking a lot of that force and reducing it before it actually hits the shore. Um, so big storms without um, coral reefs would cause huge impacts on land um, and that would cause impacts on people's houses and people's livelihoods, et cetera. And again, you know, because we're, we're connected as a country, then we're all sort of contributing to that and feeling the impacts of things like that. Um, and then I think there's this sort of stuff that we haven't even discovered yet about coral reefs, right? And so from a variety of different corals and other organisms, there's uh, pharmaceutical um, potential as well, right? So a variety of different medicines and, and um, supplements and things like that can come from coral reefs. And so if we, if we lose those um, before we really understand what's there scientifically, we could be losing cures for a variety of different diseases um, and treatments for different diseases. And that would, that would matter to everybody everywhere. Um, so I think those are, those are a variety of reasons why people all over the world should care about coral reefs and corals, as I was talking about before with all these feedbacks, um, from the processes that they're doing are involved in um, global carbon cycling, right? And so they're important for for the balance of of um, sort of materials and things like that on the earth through carbon cycling. So now what? What can we do as middle school students to help save the world? Let's listen to Dr. Putnam once more for some inspiring ideas. I think the first and, and foremost to answer is, you know, as a country and as, as on the, you know, for the world as a whole, we want to reduce our carbon emissions to reduce the amount of CO2 that is, you know, going into the atmosphere that's going, being absorbed by the oceans. Um, and that will reduce the effects of ocean acidification, right? It'll reduce how much that pH is changing. Um, but if we still have that going on and we still want to um, restore reefs um, such that they could, handle those existing emissions, then we would need all this sort of science that we're talking about. We need a, a basic understanding of the basic biology of corals, which ones are more resistant, which ones are, you know, more susceptible, and do they need to be planted or outplanted in certain ways, like in combination with algae or in combinations with different species of corals. So, so I think really there's no one single answer of this will absolutely work, but I think by increasing our understanding of the basic biology of corals and how they respond to a variety of different stressors and how they respond in different kinds of um, aggregations or assemblages, you know, these communities that we're talking about of coral and algae and crustose coral and algae and these other things, um, then we'll have the, we'll have the information, the science we need to make good choices when we're doing those restoration actions. Um, so I would say, you know, generally things like tolerant corals will be helpful because then you won't be losing your corals as quickly. Um, and maybe trying to buffer, buffer that area from ocean acidification could help increase your restoration impact. Um, but first and foremost, we want to reduce these global emissions. We can do small things such as shopping locally, riding our bikes, and walking to school if possible. If that's not possible, maybe we can carpool with a neighbor. But the possibilities are endless. We need you to take the next step to create change in the world we live in today.